The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. I'm really excited to have Renee here. Um, so yeah, she's. We, we've also been trying to get her for a couple of months too because I'm super excited about the documentary that she's um, um, participating in and, and is going to tell us all about here because um, yeah, someone that needs to tell this very valuable story of these um, two amazing um, individuals that she's going to be highlighting this evening. So, um, and I hope Renee tells a little bit about how she kind of got into this work as well because. Yeah, because I think that's also really interesting. So we met at a, at a MAPS event, and, um, and I was like, what? Doing all sorts of cool things. You should definitely come give a talk. So, so excited that you're here, and everyone give her a round of applause. Yay. Thank you. That's so kind. <laughs> How lovely. I stretch this over here. OK. Um, I'm a little tall, so the podium's a little low, so I might pick up notes once in a while. I don't mean to be rude and disconnect. Um, uh, as she said, my name is Renee, and I want to thank all of you psychonauts for coming out on a Tuesday night. You're dedicated, or medicated, or you're dedicated. <laughs> um, I've been a longtime tribesman, and um, I guess I went through my psychedelic initiation and illumination in my early 20s. And tonight I'm coming back out of the closet a bit, was raising kids and dealing with career, etc. but back out of the psychedelic closet. In fact, I went in the closet, found this, was very lucky. Um, <laughs> but um, professionally, I'm creative and I work in media and I serve um, across, you know, video games and television and film, uh, storytelling, uh, comic books, basically anyone who's got a dollar or two that can pay me to draw or create, I'm happy to collaborate with. Um, I recently um, finished my uh, Master's of Transpersonal Psychology at the University of Philosophical Research here in LA, which is a really wonderful place. If you haven't heard of it, I suggest you check it out. They also have some wonderful, wonderful lectures in the metaphysical and spiritual world. Um, there I got very interested in altered states of consciousness and psi phenomena and um, dealing with the psychedelic scene from a scientific and anthropological background, I, I got really, really motivated to get more involved. So I um, dove deeper and deeper into the scene and found out about a study that I had read about that Rick Dahlman had talked about in a magazine. Uh, he was a, su a study subject in something, and it inspired me to reach out to Dr. Charles Grove, who at the time was doing his phase one safety study on MDMA, so I was able to become a test subject and work with them um, from the inside. So that was pretty cool. And now we didn't have a tech rehearsal, so of course I'm about to hit play, and this goes away. Let's do it again. Okay, this is that part where I walk over to the machine. There we go. Here we go. Hey! Look, art. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so as I said, I, I got involved with a study and discovered Rick Doblin and MAPS, and uh, it kind of put me on the way, but um, ultimately, um, I'm a country girl at heart, and you might ask yourself, how did a nice young girl from Amish country end up in the lab where hundreds of psychoactives were born? <laughs> Other people become groupies for bands. I become groupies for chemists and thought leaders. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's a good story. And, you know, I think we can all attest that good stories have some common elements in them, right? Fairy tales are good stories, and fairy tales are full of references to fairy godmothers and fairy godparents acting as guides for us. Now, I want to point out that Anne and Sasha are not shown actual size in this photo. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a much better photo of them. Now, Wikipedia says a godparent 
right, is someone who is there around the birth of the child, but then also instructs that child religiously. So I say we take the word religious, pull the dog, walk the dog out of there, and we can talk about spiritual experience. So if that's the case, I think we can all attest that these folks are our psychedelic godparents, because I know they've taken me on a spiritual journey with their creations, their research, and their work, and I'm sure you guys too, or else you wouldn't be here. All right. So one thing I think that we've all learned in psychedelia is things aren't necessarily how they appear, right? I think a lot of people would look at a photo like this and think, gosh, here's a woman who can probably cook and clean and file her way out of any type of emergency. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love this picture of Anne. Very girl next door. Very, very girl next door. You know, um, I think she definitely looks like wife material in there, and I think Sasha would agree, right? And I dig this picture of Sasha. I do have to ask maybe what's in the pipe, but <laughs> he looks like a real swinging hep cat there, right? Berkeley born and bred. Um, I imagine him mixing chemicals to sort of like a Dave Brubeck kind of soundtrack. Uh, <laughs> He's got that kind of vibe right there. Um, uh, I'm digging his vibe there for sure. But um, more about how I got involved with them. We're going to go back in time. Ooh, melting, melting. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 1967, the same year Orange Sunshine hit the streets. So my conservative parents from Amish country back in Pennsylvania went to San Francisco for their honeymoon. So I just always tell myself the story that there must have been something in the air, probably something smoky in the air, some essence that sort of crept up into them and then suddenly here's this wannabe hippie in the middle of South Central Pennsylvania just yearning to get back, you know? Um, I do kind of freak out too to think that my parents were running around this city where, you know, STPs being sold on the street um, and um, I know, it's just very strange. I used to have this songbook on my piano at home that had the lyrics to let the sun shine in. And I remember being about five, six years old, just learning to read, looking at these lyrics. And how did that song go? There's something about uh, talking about laboratories and moving paper fantasies and Timothy Leary Deary. So here I am at like six, seven years old, going, who's this Timothy Leary guy? And where do I find him? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, this picture was actually taken uh, in San Francisco after uh, the last big MAPS conference. Are you guys conference junkies? Do you show up at a lot of the conferences? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, of course. I think that's where we typically meet each other, right? Um, so yeah, as I said, you know, STPs flying around the streets, you know, Stan and Scully are making all sorts of, you know, good little things on paper. but. Um, you know, it was really demonized at the time because the onset for DOM was supposedly very slow. Because so people would, you know, take something and think nothing was happening to them. And then they'd take some more and take some more. And suddenly all of the emergency rooms, I guess, in the Bay Area are being filled with trippy hippies. So, yeah, sadly it got demonized. Um, I know you guys talked about Palenque Norte a little bit ago. If you're not familiar with Lorenzo's podcast, it's amazing. You should check it out. It's a deep, deep archive with all of the luminaries telling you everything you've ever wanted to know about this world. So um, back in the day when people read newspapers, um, <laughs> I used to always see an ad in the LA Weekly popping up about uh, these plant seminars taking place in Mexico. Typically they were in Palenque, but one year it happened to be in Uxmal. And I decided to take a trip on down to Mexico to have a week-long immersion with some of these psychedelic leaders that I had been reading and studying. Um, here's a nice little list of people. Um, but basically it was uh, a week-long you know, study of ethnopharmacology. One of my favorite things in the description was the hallucinogenic snuff cults. I don't know if any of you guys are members. Um, if you have a meeting, you know, give me a card. I'd like to attend. <laughs> um, but uh, there was, you know, all sorts of classes all week on, you know, plant medicine and chemistry, etc. Um, I was thrilled because I had been reading, you know, Jonathan Ott. I had been, you know, seeing Rob Montgomery's botanical preservation court. Um, 
catalogs lying around at friends' houses. Terence McKenna was there. I'd met him a few times and had become very interested in his theories and lectures, especially the panspermia ideas. Um, Anne and Sasha were there, of course. Manuel Torres, Paul Stamets, who I'm sure many of you have read his stuff or maybe caught him on Joe Rogan the few times he's been there. But one thing that I remember, I was at a, um, a gathering prior to this, and Alex Gray was giving a talk saying, you know, college kids aren't studying shamanism. Well, I actually had a class in college called The Art of the Shaman, and my professor was Dr. Peter First, and he also happened to be <laughs> on this journey with me. So, uh, yeah, so people do take classes in shamanism at a university level. Alex Gray was wrong. Okay. <laughs> oh, this one's not good. I don't know why that's there. Here we go. So, <laughs> imagine, if you will, in the Yucatan Peninsula, this beautiful, beautiful set of ruins. This one is known as the um, Temple of the Magician or the Pyramid of the Magician. And uh, the hotel that this particular seminar was at was um, just on the other side of the jungle there. And I like the little palapa, but we had the opportunity to spend the whole week with our luminaries and, you know, have meals together and share. Uh, you can see Sasha and Anne's back right there. Ooh, mystical. All right, now ladies, imagine being at that palapa-covered bar, having a cocktail, and you're surrounded by these two. <laughs> you know, um, I was having a good time grilling Karen's about all sorts of things like, you know, the cathars and Monsagor, and then Sasha kept telling me that those people had muscle spasms called cathartics and whatnot. So I discovered very early on, Sasha was a bit of an ordinary guy and loved his limericks and jokes and puns and double entendres. Um, now, we are all adults here, giving parental advice because we're about to enter some adult psychedelic material here, okay? All right, he likes dirty stuff. So, <laughs> when I was asked by John Hanna to please contribute to some sort of dirty picture book, <laughs> for his birthday, um, I was happy to oblige. Here are some very typical Sasha kinds of jokes. Two antennas men on a roof, fell in love and got married. Ceremony wasn't much, but the reception was excellent. I won't bore you with all of them, but the dyslexic man that walks into a bra is pretty good too. <laughs> you know. Oh, where was another one that I think you guys would like? Let's see. Oops, see I'm just throwing papers now. Um, oh, here it is. No, it's fine. Thank you. Here's one. This one's about Gandhi, who walked barefoot, ate very little, and suffered from bad breath. That made him a super callous, fragile mystic hexed by halitosis. So this is the kind of stuff that you could expect from Sasha. Um, when I was down there, I did a lot of doodling, and I would, uh, you know, treat it like my high school classes, and I drew quite a bit. So I would draw all of the speakers while they were doing their, their lessons or what they were sharing with us. And I gotta tell you guys, I learned more in just a few hours with Sasha than I ever did in high school. I just wish I would have had an instructor that was so passionate and so gifted as he was to create metaphors and similes in things that I could understand. It wasn't just acid, base, benzene, ring. <laughs> we really made the molecules sin. But what's really weird to me, I discovered when I was at their house the last time, he kept this picture across from his desk, which I always felt was an honor. But I noticed what I wrote back there in 1998, here's to better living through chemistry. So 20 years later, <laughs> Strangely enough, magic happens. Um, I also did a sketch of Anne. Anne did uh, some wonderful talks down there about feeding the monster um, and doing shadow work. So um, I also took, you know, thought I'd share this one of her. It was fun to sketch them. Super fun. But that's basically how some conservative girl from Pennsylvania ended up becoming a long-haired weirdo hippie. <laughs> Oh, so why the shulgans? Well, I contend why not the shulgans? If there was a psychedelic hall of fame, I think the two giants, right? Who have we got? We've got Albert Hoffman, and we've got Sasha Shulgan. 
In addition to that, I look at Anne's work as an underground psychedelic therapist. Of course, first working with these compounds when they were legal, right? But still being able to be at the forefront on the war lines for us, even after they weren't legal. I think it's so brilliant that they did their books and were brave and published. So let's take a look here at their troubled godchild, <laughs> MDMA, right? Now, I gotta tell you guys, Molly, I knew Molly back in the day when she was Adam. Yes, people, Molly is trans. She used to be Adam. <laughs> I'm gonna start referring to her as they, and I suggest you do it as well. <laughs> now, this is a tract book that was published by the Church of Trick. Um, you used to be able to find these stuffed in Christian bookstores all around town in other major cities and at some of the uh, gatherings. I cannot confirm my or deny my relationship or resemblance to Sister Serotonin of the Perpetual Closet Disorder, who also is affiliated with the Church of Trick. Um, she goes to a lot of conferences and publishes under a pseudonym. <laughs> But if we're going to talk about the godchild, a lot of people mistakenly think that Sasha invented MDMA. It was actually invented in 1912. As you can see, um, if you can read there a little bit of the patent, it was uh, registered on Christmas Eve 1912. So I think MDMA is the best Christmas present the world has ever received. Thanks, Merck. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, Sasha had first tried, um, I guess, mescaline, and then got very interested in the psychedelic and psychoactive scene. Um, what he found was this extraordinary spiritual experience, and he wanted to share that, of course, with his friends, and they became their own lab rats. And as a former MDMA subject in a study, I support my fellow lab rats. <laughs> um, they had a friend named Leo Zeff, who was um, an elderly psychiatrist who was about to retire, but once he had tried what was cooking in the lab, he decided to hold off his retirement. Um, the drug was called Adam. He felt it stripped the ego and brought us back to our primordial selves. So yes, Molly used to be indeed Adam. Here's uh, Anne. This is a clip, so I'm going to have to ask for the cameras off. And our creative team on Better Living Through Chemistry had never really been put together before. I'm going to introduce you to some of the team. Okay, um, there's some weirdo in the back making a peace sign. I'm sure you've met her, that's me. <laughs> there's a, a lady there named Tanya Manning. The gentleman in the back is Dr. Paul Daly. He's worked with Sasha in the lab for years and years and years. Um, the lady with the glasses is Sue Johnson, our cinematographer. Over there in the corner is uh, Dei Chen, who has been a caregiver for the, uh, the Shulmans for years. And the ginger in the middle is Connie Littlefield, who's the director of our film. Connie is an amazing documentary, documentary storyteller uh, from Toronto. And um, here, she's very shy, which is why she's not here tonight. You see her hiding behind the lab door there. <laughs> <laughs> and also hiding over there by the camera. She actually wrote a little note that uh, she asked me to share with you to introduce her tonight. Okay, there she is with Sasha back in 2003. All right. Hello, lovely people. I am Connie Little. Should I get this with a Canadian accent? Should I? <laughs> I, I'm teasing her. I wouldn't do that. She's probably watching me now and stabbing me. But in a little voodoo doll. Um, <laughs> I'm Connie Littlefield, a uh, documentary filmmaker from Toronto. Thanks much to the AWARE Project for hosting this event. Renee has asked me to write something in describing my work, so here we go. I've been working in the film business all my adult life, primarily in documentary. I work on other people's films in addition to my own doing research, production management, and story editing. I make my own films whenever I can, and I have been very fortunate to do this. In 2002, the National Film Board of Canada released an hour-long documentary that I wrote and directed about the early history of LSD. Some of you may have seen this. It was called Hoffman's Potion. 
This film has had an incredible reach and has been credited with changing the way many people think about psychedelic drugs. At the time, it was maybe the fourth documentary film ever made, in English, on the subject of psychedelics. How many are there now? 18,000? It's a rough guess from her. Something like that. Here's a clip from Hoffman's Potion. Oh, before I get into the clip, uh, you might recognize uh, some people in this photo that she actually had in this film. I should share that with you. Graham Das, who's incredible. Uh, Miss Laura Huxley. Down there at the bottom, we've got Ralph Mensner. Um, right over, I guess about 10 o'clock to him is Myron Stolaroff. And of course, Uncle Al, right there with his LSD model and molecule. And um, camera's off for this one, I believe. Yes. Here we go. Thanks, guys. I was incredibly lucky because I filmed these interviews just before many of these subjects passed away. A handful of Ralph Nensner, Ron Doss, and Stan Brock are still with us. But Albert Hoffman, Myron Humphrey, Laura Huxley, uh, Duncan, and unfortunately, Ben Hopper have all passed away. As you can imagine, making this film changed my life and it introduced me to the characters and stories that occupied me for the rest of my career, apparently. <laughs> my primary connection to the world came through the grace and guidance of Myron, the guy from the picture before, uh, who I've mentioned, and he had opened a lot of doors for me. When Hoffman's Potion was finished, I told Myron that I didn't know what film to make next. He suggested that I focus on his friends, Anne and Sasha Schulman. I started taking, I started making Better Living Through Tennessee, the Shulman film, around 2002, and between then and 2006, I thought I shot about 20 hours of footage. Though I tried hard, I was able to find any funding at the time for the project, so I eventually just was forced to abandon the film and move on. This was, of course, before crowdfunding had been invented. In 2008, I wrote and directed Damage Done, The Drug War Odyssey, a film about the uh, cops of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, which was called the smartest documentary yet on a divisive subject by the Vancouver Sun. Here I'm going to show you a little clip from Damage Young, Connie's film. Let's see. former police chief for the city of Seattle. I served in that capacity for six years. Before that, I served for 28 years in the San Diego Police Department. And do trace my own observations about the drug war to an arrest that I made when I'd been a cop for about two years. Um, and I had a 19-year-old in the backseat of my police car, uh, handcuffed. Uh, I had arrested him for being in possession of marijuana. This was in his own home. Uh, I should say his parents' home. Uh, I kicked down the door, which I was legally justified in doing in those days, uh, and I arrested him for the mere possession of a, a small quantity of marijuana, most of which he had tried to flush down the toilet. Uh, and on the way to jail, um, he's sitting in the backseat of my caged police car saying things like, oh, wow, <laughs> are you stumped? Uh, He's talking about the cage, and he was asking me if I got any Fritos or any Cheetos. I mean, it was it was that experience. I thinking, what the hell am I doing? I could be doing police work. <laughs> it's inconceivable that we will have a drug for the America. A lot of truth in that. <laughs> Um, she goes on to say, I forgot to mention while researching Hoffman's Potion back before the turn of the century, I had thought it would be a film about the entire history of LSD up until the present day. But it wound up being a historic film, one which concludes with the ban on LSD in 1967. There's that year again. Um, however, in the early research, I met these incredible characters and I thought they deserved a film of their own. It took a while, but 2015's The Sunshine Makers, which I wrote and produced, has been well received by movie audiences everywhere. So here's a clip from Sunshine Makers I'm going to ask to turn off again. This is Connie and Nick just hours before he passed. Um, she 
she goes on to discuss Nick a little bit in the letter. I'll share that with you as she asked me. Um, she wants to remind you you can view the whole thing on uh, Netflix or iTunes. When she brought this film to Oakland to the big gathering in April at the Psychedelic Science Convention, Connie uh, goes on to say, I ran into Anne Shulman and her daughter Wendy. I hadn't seen Anne in over 10 years since before Sasha had passed. They invited me to a small gathering they were having at the farm two days later. When the day arrived, I stopped for gas en route and picked up my messages, and that's when I found out that Nick Sand, one of the subjects of the Sunshine Makers, had died. He had been at the screening on Saturday night, idolized by the crowd, standing ovation in all of his glory. It seemed fitting that Nick would pass away the day after our film premiered in the hometown crowd. He went out on a high note, and that's for sure. She says after working on this story for 20 years, she felt pretty connected to Nick. When I arrived at Children Farm, the atmosphere was very subdued. Everyone there knew Nick. We all stood around Anne Shulgin's chair chatting, mostly about Nick. After a while, Anne asked about my life during the preceding 10 years, and I told her the long story of how the Sunshine Makers came to happen. Finally, she took me by the arm, pulled me down, and she could uh, whisper directly into my ear, and she said, I think it's time for you to finish your Shulkin film. And that's when she took this selfie at that gathering. And um, then she goes on to say, Anne introduced me to Renee about a month later, and I was delighted to discover, oh, this is sweet, a world-class film designer who felt the same way about the story as I do. We're ramping up to launch a crowdfunding campaign in a few weeks. And then she's like, oh, all currencies are accepted, so don't worry that she's Canadian. <laughs> she also says thanks to everyone coming, and especially thanks to Renee. Oh, well, stay tuned for the next chapter of this chemical love story. All right, so I guess writing that inscription 20 years ago in Mexico really was a magical thing, because here I am, and here you guys are all tonight. You know, this is really about their legacy. Um, on the next slide, yeah, the cameras can stay on for this. This is just a little walk around uh, Shulgin's farm so you can get a sense of the lay of the land there. It's a really beautiful place, Northern California. Lots of buildings, lots of good stuff to climb around on. legal, uh, sociological perspective. People have trip reports on there. 
Um, the other thing that I really treasure about Arrowhead is it is a valuable tool in emergency rooms across the globe uh, when people are having you know, contraindication or adverse effects uh, with, their, um, with whatever they've ingested. So they're just such a wonderful group. And they always had this uh, thing called, what was it, Ask the Shulgin. So you could uh, send a letter into Arrowhead and they would pass it on to Anna and Sasha and you could you know, ask for advice or find out the history of one of his compounds. But yes, I, I really recommend, if you haven't checked out Arrowhead, that you please do. All right. So um, Sasha had worked for Dow Chemical. Um, and apparently he was the first creator of a biodegradable insecticide with Zectran, which I love, right there in the little blue letters. Um, so I was saying, you know, sure, here's this guy who's had these humble beginnings, and I noticed the statues there, those are all Hummel figurines, so I just made a little pun there, they're Hummel beginnings. Um, next I would like to share another clip with you with um, a woman that I introduced you to before in the group picture named Tanya. Tanya's been a caregiver and assistant to Anna and Sasha for quite some time. So if I could ask if we could dim the cameras again. So apparently um, he'd be publishing all of these papers in the journals. However, he would be publishing with Dow's return address. Once things got a little hot and hairy in the media, they insisted that he no longer publish with their address and please publish from home. Yeah. Now, um, I guess that's because psychedelic work can be dangerous. Chemical work can be dangerous. This is a shot I took outside the lab. I love the sign on his doorway. There's also a notification there, too, that it is a known lab to the local authorities, etc. Um, you know, after he got his, uh, he was in the Navy and got his PhD in biochem from Berkeley, so he's always been around this area. He also did postdoctorate work in psychiatry and pharmacology at UC San Francisco, and he worked briefly as a research director at BioRad Labs becoming, before becoming a senior researcher at Dow, so people often ask about his pathway, and that's what that was. Um, Let's see. I've got another clip I'd love to share with you with Dr. Paul, so if you wouldn't mind turning the cameras off again. All sorts of strange and interesting things in this little shack. Um, there's one now. <laughs> uh, uh, I like the panoramic view at the top. It's a very, very small little lab. has a nice fireplace in it. Um, and again, I'm just so amazed that so many psychoactives were, you know, born and bred in this small space. Um, here's our cinematographer, Sue, peeking through some of the glassware, etc. And there's a bookshelf inside, and I noticed that there's two very ominous books there that might be your next great read. Um, have, has anyone in the room read Picall or Chicall? Hey, preaching to the choir, right on, right on. Well, uh, Anne and Sasha believe that, well, not everyone had the ability to get to a conference or um, get to a seminar. Most people did have the ability to get to a book. So they decided to start publishing um, their story, both chemically and their chemical love story. So uh, the books, uh, take place with them bouncing back and forth from chapter to chapter using Sasha's voice and Anne's voice. Um, but they uh, use pseudonyms because it's, you know, we can't really prove it's them in the story. <laughs> I guess that's for their own protection. But um, the book's in the two parts, as I discussed, and the synthesis instructions, the bioessays, the dosages, etc., are made freely available on arrowwood.org, the website I mentioned earlier. So if you are interested in uh, checking out some excerpts of his work, you're welcome to check there. Um, I mean, some of the reactions described maybe beyond the ability of people who are 
are not really beyond high school chemistry. Um, some of the techniques are, um, you know, might be more difficult to obtain, but it is nice to get a view and lens into his work and his processes. Um, I had the opportunity with Connie in October to return to the farm. We're going to start going through the lab notes and the um, what's known as the Shulman Archive. They collected and kept everything from the letters that were written to them from students, fellow researchers, psychiatrists, psychologists, um, you know, uh, newspaper clippings, uh, photos. So I'm very eager to get back up there and see what else we can include in our film to share with everybody, what gems in the archival sand there might be. So uh, I do like the file cabinet what's surrounding there, I like the MDMA, shaman, serotonin, etc. cetera. Um, I also dig his STP sign in the lab back there. So, um, talking about Pical and Tikal, this is Wendy, who Connie talked about with Anne. This is uh, probably very soon after they reconnected there, because Anne was just at the conference for a very short time. Uh, Wendy runs Transform Press, which is the Shulman's publishing house, and um, the commemorative editions of Pical and Tikal are um, available now for pre-order. They should be released by the end of September, early October. In fact, there's going to be a signing, if you're interested, in Berkeley at Abe's Books. First week of October, I believe, and she'll be out signing copies of the book. The reason you see four books here instead of two, they thought it might not be a bad idea to divide the books up and put Anne's section in her own two books and Sasha's section in their two books. So you've got the chemical story and the love story as separate volumes. Um, Wendy did let me know that they will be available as hardback and paperback, in case you're interested. I know I am. Here's my old dog-eared copy that I had signed by Sasha back in Mexico in 1998. And on the right, I just wanted to share one of his most famous quotes. Um, it just always touches me, and oftentimes when I'm researching him or Anne, this keeps popping up, so I thought I'd put it up there in case anyone wanted a picture just, just to have on their fridge. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, Anne and Sasha, as I said, wrote the book together. I'm going to ask the cameras go off again because I have another clip to share with you where she's talking about her writing process with her charming husband. So I introduced you a bit to Wendy before. Um, that's her husband there, Jason. If you're a burner, you might recognize his pillars from the playa. He's quite a visual artist, and Jason's a very good friend. I'm so proud of him because he just got nominated for an Emmy for his work on Twin Peaks. Uh, he's an editor on uh, David Lynch's show. This is their daughter, Audrey, who spends a lot of time with Anne. Um, and also apparently has a connection to psychedelic, psychotic cats. <laughs> but uh, as I said, yeah, check out Transform Press and uh, check out the books if you already have not. It's incredible. Um, now, Anne spends time with Audrey, as I mentioned. They do a lot of painting together. I think another reason I have an affinity for Anne is I myself am an illustrator and artist, and that's what Anne studied. Um, you know, she is the daughter of diplomats, born in New Zealand, very well-traveled, well-educated, and grew up in Italy, um, but spent a lot of time drawing and painting. So here she is with Connie and Sue, uh, sharing her sketchbooks and some recent work that she did with um, Miss Audrey. She likes to paint a lot of plants, lots and lots of plants. I wonder why. So um, this is a photo that Connie recently shared with me. And I found this kind of strange and interesting because I started to look at it and I went back to 2006 and realized, oh yeah, I was with them at the Palenque Norte tent. After they did their talk, everyone, it seemed from the playa, was surrounding them and wanting autographs and to talk with them. And we all know how evil that sun is in the desert out there, right? So. I grabbed my hat, I put it on, and I was like, oh yeah, that's my hat. And I was like, oh, I gave Sasha 
of my Maria Sabina shirt that I designed as my playa gift that year. And I was like, oh, he's holding the shirt. I had never seen this photo before. And then I realized, oh, there's me back there hiding behind her. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, as I said, you know, other people follow the dead. I guess I've been following the shulkins around. <laughs> Um, now, I mentioned if there was a, you know, psychedelic hall of fame, it would have to have, you know, Albert and Mr. Alexander, Sasha Shulgin, and also their wife. But they were recognized by High Times at the Cannabis Cup as counterculture hall of fame winners. So there you go. That's a very big honor. <laughs> She's very proud of this trophy. <laughs> Um, I also love this image that Alex Gray did of them, and uh, he was kind enough to do an honor and an unveiling at a MAP-sponsored um, psychedelic science conference in 2010, I believe it was. Um, this is a little private unveiling before they did the big one. Um, there's always been all sorts of fundraisers and whatnot to help them out. I don't know if you realize this, but their uh, lab actually was rated by the very same people who had licensed them. You know, Sasha was hired by our government to create and study these psychoactives and then they turn around and then they smack him on the hand and take away his license. Um, at that time they were fined, I believe it was 25 grand, and they were able to raise the funds in a week due to all the wonderful friends and family that they have around the globe. So um, I just think it's so wonderful how they've touched science, research, culture at large. I think of musicians, I think of writers, filmmakers, I think about, you know, just Joe on the street um, having better lives because they were able to imbibe in some of their work and, and transform their lives. Um, I have another clip I'd like to share, so if I can ask you to dim the lenses back there. I know for me that was a rough year. I lost like, uh, what was it, 22 friends, family, and associates in the space of 17 months. Kicking off with my father passing and Sasha passing, etc. It was a very heavy, heavy year for me. Um, I did this graphic and passed it out at the memorial. I put them on pins and like little t-shirts and gave them to some special friends and family that I knew would be gathering at his memorial. The memorial took place at the Berkeley Community Theater and um, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people there, you know, long hairs, short hairs, gray hairs, Birkenstock wearing, you know, Chanel wearing, just a, a huge, huge group um, of various people. Um, I've got one more clip that I'd love to share because our time's running out. Um, this is Greg, this is Tanya's husband who's also a caregiver and um, helps out on the property. Anyway, um, we're going to be wrapping up here. I just want to encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about their work, uh, going to shulganresearch.org. There's plenty of information there about publications, etc. Um, and, you know, I keep plugging the whole uh, P call, T call thing because I think they're important pieces of writing. Because um, it's about legacy, right? We want their work to live on and on beyond our generation future generations. You guys are the OGs of the psychedelic renaissance. Um, Kahani asked me to share this with you. Um, if you do decide that you want to support the project, you can get a tax deduction. We like that. Um, heck, you can even be an associate producer on the film. Join us. One of us. One of us. One of us. Um, I'm going to be returning to Shulgin Farm with Connie the uh, first week of October, as I said, for that great event at Abe's Books. And uh, we're moving into the editing phase of our film, as well as, I said, going through the archive and seeing what gems we can find there. But, um, you know, we really appreciate your support if that's something you could do. Also, if you have your own anecdotes, stories, etc., cetera, um, you know, uh, film, uh, photos, you know, get in touch. Um, because we want to keep the story of Sasha's low calorie martini out there in society as it's changing. PTSD especially is, you know, um, the trials are now in phase three and to think that we're so close to having legalized therapeutic settings is 
beyond me when I think back to 20 years ago and starting on this journey. And as I said, he liked his limericks. This was one he wrote. There once was a chemist named Sasha who inscribed on the tabula rasa, for those who are keen on phenylethylamines, read Pical, then imbibe in Tukasa. <laughs> And I have a door prize tonight. I brought a print of um, Anne, that image I did of Anne when I was in Mexico. This is Connie on the right, and I found, I noticed when we were interviewing a living luminary in the scene that they both had belt buckles from Owsley that had been gifted to them. So the first person who can come up to me tonight and correctly guess who might be on the left, I've got a print for you to take home, if you would like. Ooh. Anyway, thank you guys. It's the time that we open up for questions, but you know what? I'm going to turn it around, and I'd like to ask you guys if anyone would like to share their story about how the Shulman's work has affected them. Anyone? Any? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I, I remember getting really pulled into uh, organic chemistry just by reading his work and his, his chemistry and, and, and how to manufacture and then the qualitative comments. and. That's when I had a few psychedelic experiences of my own, and it was like, "What is this? Right. What are these? What are these references?" And and I remember going into Ocan, and then it was just everything just snapped into place. And it was, and then going back and reading it again, and then like even reading it now. And every time I read P call and T call or excerpts, it takes on new meaning, and it's just it's it really is just so transformative. Reading. I couldn't give a better testimony either. I mean, like I said, I learned more in the jungle in Mexico in a few hours from him than I ever had in four years of high school. You know? Anyway. Um, anyone else? Anecdotes? Stories? Dirty pictures? Okay. <laughs> That's another film. We won't talk about that. Um, any, any questions for me that I can answer legally? Yes, ma'am. You're there with the fabulous frames. Who are you? Thanks for the note. Right. Um, I would like to hear a little more about what Anne was doing because um, I haven't had a chance to fully read the book. I heard that she was guiding. Is that right? Or right. Well, Anne um, is what she would call herself a lay therapist. Um, she had a lot of history in psychology and psych psychiatry through. Um, primary relationships, etc. And it was always um, something that she just really fancied, but she never went back and got her degree. However, um, I, I will put her up against anyone with several pieces of paper on their wall at any time. So yes, she spent a lot of time in the underground counseling people who had um, anything from sexual trauma, PTSD, borderline personality, etc. And not necessarily that these things may have been named in the scenarios, but she certainly helped people who had those types of issues by being a strong and responsible and empathetic sitter and listener. She's one of the most compassionate people and empathetic people I think I've ever met. So yeah, she is uh, definitely the first boots on the ground when it comes to uh, therapeutic psychedelic work. That's what she was doing. Was she involved at all? In, was she ever involved in the like formulation of like how MAPS is, is sort of curating treatment with therapists? I think, um, yeah, she's been consulted quite a bit. I mean, so many people from their experiment group, right? They would, you know, have a, a new uh, a psychoactive compound that he used, and as I said, they were with their own lab rats. So, um, they did their own study protocols. I mean, if you look at their notes, the protocols are very much like what you see in a university, you know, licensed, approved study. So yes, I, I feel that that model that, that they had is very much something that Rick and the team has looked at. As, and um, if you're not familiar with um, MAPS, they're a wonderful organization. Um, they are actually working very closely with CIIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies, and there's actually a certification program now that I think they've had about 80 practitioners go through to get certified to work with uh, people in therapeutic settings, to work with patients. So um, everyone's really getting ready and ramped up uh, to continue the work that they started. You know? Good question. Thank you. Anyone? Yes, you, sir. Yes. I've never seen this man before. Security. Uh, <laughs> is there an ETA for the release of this uh, 
exciting future? Uh, before I pass away, no. <laughs> We're looking at 2019, but depending on what we find when we get up there, it might be 2020, and I think that's a nice, nice year too because it's about vision and seeing. But um, hopefully it'll be 2019. But as I said, if we find some goodies, uh, we might get down a whole new rabbit hole and be able to share some other stuff. So serendipity. <laughs> and also because we are independent and not tied to a studio contract, we can you know, not have to rush through. We can get it done to the way Connie wants it to be done. So I'm excited about that. I think it's going to be good. If you saw Sunshine Makers, if you saw Hoffman's Potion, She's a hell of a storyteller. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do you know anything about the new book that they were kind of in the middle of writing, I believe? And then it's, and then you showed a little bit of uh, an image of it at the end. Do you know anything about that? I think part of it was the, the, the cactus book. The, I think so, yeah. Yeah, you know what? I haven't really talked to her about it, so I don't feel like I'm at liberty to answer properly, but I would like to learn about that myself because yeah, I'm a cactophile. You know, yeah. I'm sure. I I know when I was up there, she did have a package of notes, and I know she was talking to Connie about it. But I was doing other things, so I really can't answer. But yeah, I know she's she's working on something else, which is wonderful. Well, guys, I want to thank you for you know letting me drone on at you this way and uh, putting up with my technical difficulties and spending time with me, like I said, on a Tuesday night. I feel honored that you took time out to spend with me. I'm really grateful. Thank you so much. And you know, check us out on Conceptive Films. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and, and keep up. And as I said, if you feel driven to give, Connie and I are great or beyond everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Renee. I'm so excited that this work is being, um, being done and we're, we're documenting. Uh, you know, that, that we're, con they're, we're paying attention enough to that we're documenting all this stuff as it's happening. Sunshine and the Makers was, uh, was great. I highly recommend checking that out. Um, and just uh, excited to be, um, yeah, I was, I was at the Shulman Farm um, when uh, when um, when they found about about Nick Sand passing, and, and so it was a really interesting day. I'd never been to the farm before, and um, so that was such a fascinating after the psychedelic science conference and um, being able to see the lab and just you know, and but being there at the same time when everybody had gotten the news and yeah, such a fascinating time. I feel terrible because I kept seeing him pass by and I was like, oh, I'll catch him later. I'll catch him later. And I didn't. So that was a lesson to me to connect with people when you have mm -hmm. the chance because they might be the last. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that wisdom. Um, I'm excited for David to share a little bit of music. <laughs> 